now, I'd like to welcome Adyasha, who is probably hidden somewhere behind here. Adyasha, where is she? Ah, there she is. Well, Adyasha, I need to take my notes, because you told us, I, I lost my notes, but you told us that you liked, I don't know, you like poetry, you like long, long, long distance running, you like, ah, oh, awesome, you, you're great. You, have, you like skydiving. Whoa, I mean, you do so many things. Is this your first slam? Yeah, this is my first slam. Huh. So yeah. this is something you didn't do yet? No, this is one of the things I haven't done yet, so, so that's why I'm okay. here. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, for your email, I don't think you did everything. No, because <laughs> she also has a message for you guys out in the room. Do you want to talk about the comics very shortly? Yeah, so if anyone of you here follows XKCD, SNBC, or PhD Comics, feel free to just meet me and we should absolutely geek out after this is over. So yeah, all fans out there. Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing being, I wanted to Google what X. K, C, D, and S, M, B, C comics are. But I didn't have time to Google it because, you know, my PC is working on Windows right now and it's slow as hell. So, um, I, didn't, I don't know what it is, but thanks. By the way, like you said to me that you, do, you like motorcycle races and you like actually participating and not watching. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Adyasha, but like, did, you expect, <laughs> did you expect me to think that you would only watch a motorcycle race? <laughs> Surely not. Okay, Adyasha. Are you ready? Yeah. Starting three. Oh no, I'm sorry. So bad. Uh, ready now? Yeah. Test this. Try to kill someone. Uh, the, the laser. Test? The laser. The laser. Yeah, but it's not important. Oops, okay. okay. Three, two. Oh, we have a problem. Uh, wrong way around. Awesome. Uh, three, two, one, go. This is Adyasha, and I'll be talking about conquering tight spaces with rescue drones. Now, when it comes to science and technology, we always like to ask, start with three questions. Why, what, and how? Why is this question important to us? What are the challenges that we face while solving this issue? And how do we finally overcome them? And that is exactly what we'll be doing today. So when it comes to rescue, we know that all hazards become disaster when rescue does not arrive in time. And with rescue operations, we need it to be fast, we need to be able to scan large areas really quickly. And a lot of times these are areas which are physically inaccessible to human beings because maybe you cannot reach them just with ground vehicles. So of course, aircrafts are a really natural choice and they're becoming really common when it comes to outdoor rescue situations. But when it comes to indoor rescue situations, for example, fire or collapsed buildings in cases of earthquake, nuclear reactor disasters, collapsed mines, these are again spaces which require the rescue to arrive fast, be able to scan large areas, and these are definitely physically inaccessible to human beings. But we don't really see rescue drones being used here because rescue drones in indoor operations face really tight situations. They're physically confined. Now, what exactly are the challenges that they face? Well, for that, we need to know a bit about flying. So, basic flying, route, flying routes. First of all, Try to stay in the middle of the air. Do not go near the edges of it. The edges of air can be identified by buildings, ground, the sea, and interstellar space. It's much difficult to fly in there. And that really is the problem when it comes to indoor spaces because we are not just flying like in the middle of the air, we are actually flying into buildings, right? And what happens when you go close to the ground is you have something called the ground effect, an aviation term for just saying that the air that the aircraft pushes downwards, if you're close enough to the ground, it bounces back to the aircraft and that can lead to some really funny results. It's not common for the indoor aircraft so much. I mean, you also experience it in outdoor aircraft when you're taking off and landing. But when it comes to indoor aircraft, there is another thing, especially if you think about the buildings, the air also bounces off from the wall and the roof. And we also have an aviation term for that, which is called, surprise, surprise, ball effect. <laughs> You're not very fancy with the terminology, you are really simple-minded people. So you have this ground and wall effect and the aircraft can act really funny. And to define all of these, we have some more aviation terms. And these are actually really commonly used and they're often even the famous last words. Namely, why is it doing that? <laughs> Where are we? Oh shit. <laughs> no shit. True story. This happens all the time. If you think about aviation, we really started with people with no equations. Wright brothers, 
literally winged it. And that is how the tradition continues in aviation. We always try to work with equations, but yeah, we experiment and we also use the terminologies really, really often. So when it comes to indoor spaces, one of the problems that we face is the ground on the wall effect. And now that we have the terminology, hopefully we'll be able to deal with that. But another problem that we face is that you're in an environment where you cannot use GPS. You do not know how to locate yourself and often the communication is not really proper when you're inside, right? So that is another problem that you have. How does the drone know where it is? And we're talking about a drone that if you leave it at the starting point, can go inside, scan the whole area, tell you somebody's trapped there and exit. And it has to be able to do all of that on its own. And how does it do that? So well, what it does is basically it takes this environment and it divides it, it divides it into grid and now it has all these cells. So if a cell is occupied by an obstacle, well it says yeah it is occupied and it tries to look at all the free cells and it tries to see if it has a continuous block of free cells from the starting point to the ending point. And if it does, for example in the case C, it would just go from the start point that is S to G directly. And of course it is important that the cell size are at least as large as your aircraft. It's really simple, but a simpler way to visualize it is just imagine playing hopscotch. I don't know how you play it here, but at least in India where I grew up playing, what we used to do is that there are two things that you need to know. One thing is how do you reach the place, right? And that is what we achieved with the grid. Second thing you need to know are your physical capabilities. Can you actually jump that far? Secondly, how much stronger do you have to balance on like one foot and you know, just try to know, try to know your own physical capabilities. And that is exactly what we drew with drones as well, except that it is in 3D. So, to understand the physical capabilities though, we need to have a bit of aerodynamics. Now, when it comes to fixed wing aircrafts, I really did the slide of the robot dynamics class, the robotics people would know. <laughs> and this is really tough even for us to understand. And because these fixed wing aircrafts are so tough, we decided we'll work with helicopters instead. And understanding helicopter flight is really easy. First of all, helicopters do not fly. They're just loud and ugly and the earth repels them. That's the first thing. Second thing, if something hasn't broken in your helicopter, it's about to. And third thing, because helicopters are always wanting to break up, you need to take a check ride. And the check ride has to be like a skirt, short enough to be interesting, but long enough to cover everything important. So we have some good skirts, some long ones, and the short one at the center, I'm sorry. But we can see it afterwards. So this is the drone we were working with, and now we get a surprisingly sexy helicopter. I mean, look at all those curves, it's so sleek. And because it is so sexy, it will not be repelled by Earth. So instead, I had to spend my whole summer driving all these equations and more. But now, when I wrote it, wrote them down, every equation like a page long, and there are six of them. But all they talk about is basically how does it move upwards? Can it move forward? How does it move sideways? Can it turn around in different ways? That is all these equations talk about. And that is how we come back to hopscotch. If you remember playing hopscotch, if you want to stand on like one leg, and that is the equivalent of the helicopter trying to turn in these different ways. And what we do typically when you're standing on one leg is that you need to know how to balance your shift to your center of mass. And that is what this drone has and that is what it makes it really unique because it has two, I mean, it has these two masses which can be moved and it has a movable center of mass. That is what allows it to be really, really maneuverable, really, really agile. And all of this is encoded in all these complicated looking equations. So if you want to have some fun, maybe this is not the kind of fun I had in mind, but yeah, we can discuss the comics later. Those are more fun than this for sure. And I'll have a short video to show exactly what we could achieve once we had these things in line. During an emergency scenario, when every second counts, what if we could send an enhanced unmanned aerial vehicle into danger rather than risk more lives? Having vital information could mean the difference between life and death. We specialize in deploying robots or manned vehicles in what we call confined spaces, where you don't see flying machines and robots being deployed. 
because it's complex to go there. The Navigate is an unmanned aerial vehicle designed to go where other vehicles can't. This is due to its unique flying characteristics that allow it to maneuver at zero speed and pitch hover at various angles. Once the Navigate is given a mission, it's able to think on its own. Internal sensors create a map of the infrastructure, allowing it to maneuver through highly confined spaces, such as collapsed buildings, mines, and beneath tree cover. There's a need to be able to navigate a confined space where you don't have GPS, where you might have difficulties with communication because you have walls. Such a rescue personnel, they have the suspicion that there might be something down there, but they don't have the data. Put the subject down, northeast corner basement level. Having the ability to maneuver in confined spaces allows search and rescue personnel to verify the suspicion. And potentially save lives. Subject is conscious. We're hoping to make a difference, being able to, to get information faster. And, uh, and provide assistance to, to a number of possible uh, missions that we actually perform every day. As this technology continues to mature, more people will be kept from harm's way, and emergency personnel will have a revolutionary new tool at their disposal. So that was a short video about how the project turning is turning out. So this is all actually at the University of Calgary in Canada. That is where I worked my last summer. Wonderful place you should visit it. And that is my advisor, Dr. Alex. I was working at the Air 2 s Laboratory at the University of Calgary. They also have a spin-off for Front Robotics, of which Dr. Alex is the CEO and the founder. And at the Air 2 s Laboratory, we work at really these aspects. For example, I was working to make it more maneuverable. They also work on the navigation aspects of these things. I find this technology really exciting because it combines saving people with fun stuff and you can actually see your code being working in real life and I hope you find it as exciting as I do too. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs>